Welcome to the Health Channel, all health, all the time. I'm Kathy Buccio coming to you from the Baptist Health South Florida studios. The idea that pain is processed by the brain has been accepted since the 1600s. And research has shown that as pain signal travels, there are also complex interactions between nerves in your spine and nerves in your brain. These interactions can either decrease or increase the strength of the pain signal. And the strength of the signal may be changed by mood, sleep, stress, and even by someone's genetic makeup. This can explain why people experience pain in different ways. And joining us to help understand and help relieve pain is Dr. Antonio Mesa, a neurologist with Baptist Hospital and the president-elect of the Dade County Medical Association. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Mesa. Thank you. If you already feel it, we're going to have a fantastic show. So, first off, when you hit your funny bone, it can feel like the worst pain in the world. So, at least for the moment, what is happening in your body to experience that pain? Well, so the funny bone, which is right here, is actually what you're hitting is the ulnar nerve. And the ulnar nerve is a nerve that goes, is very superficial right mm -hmm. here at the elbow. So it's very easy to, to tap it. In fact, right. I can, I'm tapping it now in me. When you do that, the nerve gets a, a jolt, a signal, which is a, 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 an electrical jolt. That goes, it's a reflex, and it goes straight to your spinal cord and back and up to your brain. And that is, uh, doable in any superficial nerve, actually. Right. You can do it here in the wrist, you can do it here in the Travels elbow. Travels quite quickly to that. It <laughs> does, it does. Pain. You know <laughs> when you do it. And that's classic for nerve pain. Right. That's what nerve pain is, is, is an irritation of the nerve. And now we're going to talk about peripheral vascular diseases, which include peripheral artery disease, or PAD, pelvic pain, and opioids. And doctor, yes. you wanted to talk specifically about these topics, so tell me why. Is there a correlation between them all? Yes, so the reason we chose these topics is primarily because they affect a lot of people, but they're not commonly um, um, thought of as, as pain conditions. And so there's a lot of people who suffer from, from problems in these areas and don't get treatment, don't, right. don't even ask for treatment when there are plenty of treatments available that they are suffering needlessly. And they're suffering because they think, oh, it'll go away on its own, or I don't want to go get it checked out. Or there's nothing that can be done. You know, I, I don't know anybody who has this, or they don't talk about it, or, or they, they, they just don't realize that this is abnormal and this needs right. to be treated. Hmm. Now, you, we mentioned earlier you are the president-elect of the Miami-Dade County Medical Association. So what is the ultimate goal of you as, as president of that? Well, so... My, my personal goal as, as, as president is going to be the, the educating the public about the quality issue. What we found is a lot of patients are, are, are being given all of this information about quality. Right. But they don't know what is meant by quality. Different organizations have different criteria for what quality means. Many times they're financial criteria as opposed to say, the doctor's skill or ability. And so the patients are misled. We want to address that as a medical society and, and, and kind of help the public understand what it means to have medical quality. Okay, so then let me take it one step further. What is the quality that you're specifically speaking about? So quality from a physician's perspective, right? From my perspective, when I send a patient to another doctor, I expect that doctor to be a good person, right? It's important. A good doctor and someone who has the skills and ability to do what I think needs to be done. Right. That's nothing to do with finances, mm -hmm. right? I don't... Equate it with money. I don't equate it with money. I don't necessarily need to look for the cheapest. I don't need to look for the most expensive. What I care about is the person who's gonna get the job done. Right. That's quality. And get it done the right way. Get it done the right way as soon as possible. Nobody likes to suffer. No. So if I have someone that is going to take a year to diagnose a condition that I think should be diagnosed in a month, well, you know, I'm going to go to with the guy who's going to hook me up in a month. Right. Now let's talk about that suffering, or in this case, not suffering, when patients come to you, coming specifically for pain. How do you help them with the pain? Well, so the, the key thing with pain, and this is a very important concept, is pain is a symptom. 
it is not a diagnosis, right? So back pain classically mm -hmm. is, this, uh, is, is, is almost treated like as if it were a, a, a medical condition. It is not. It is a symptom of something else. So in the areas that we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about peripheral artery disease, so that's going right. to present with pain in the legs. We're going to talk about pelvic pain. Um, just because a person has pain, that's not the diagnosis. So the first thing, and this is classically true for neurologists, we, we are trained to think that way. We are trained to look for the cause and, and localize where the problem is. We call it localizing the lesion. And then once we know the cause, then we treat it. Right. Uh, we don't just treat it. You have to know where it comes from. You have to know where it comes from, or you're, you'll never be successful. Right. So let's start with the peripheral vascular disease. It's sure. caused by the same kind of disease that causes heart attacks and strokes, but it's mostly in the legs. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so tell me a little bit about that. Well, so peripheral vascular disease encompasses venous disease and arterial disease. Okay. So we're going we're gonna to concentrate on the arterial disease because that's really the stuff that's related to heart attacks and strokes and so forth. Uh, Peripheral venous disease can cause pain and other problems, but that's not quite the same thing. So peripheral arterial disease is something that uh, the, the same risk factors that cause heart attacks and strokes mm -hmm. will, will damage the arteries in the, in the legs. And so the person will start to develop all these symptoms, one of which is pain, but not the only one. Um, there are other symptoms. Patients will develop skin color changes or skin will will darken the, the 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 affected limb will become cooler um, the the circulation will diminish there will be hair loss if you have hair on your on your limbs some people right. don't um, and then as that gets worse you start to develop pain when you walk and then it gets even worse and you have pain at rest and then it gets even worse and you start to get ulcerations and that's how you lose a leg or, or even an arm. And it's sometimes when that person has that pain when they walk and they find relief when they sit, but even when there's no relief when you sit, that's a problem. It's a real problem. Right. I mean, it, it, this, this, is not, this is a very serious condition. So what are the complications from a condition like that? Uh, the, the, well, the, <laughs> the worst complication for a lot of people is, would be a limb loss, right? right? They cut off your leg. Mm -hmm. But if you really look at the medical literature, your big complications are strokes and heart attacks. Wow. So if you have this pain when you walk, and it's related to poor circulation, you have to worry about heart attacks and stroke. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there's another uh, manifestation of it, and it kind of ties into the pelvic pain. A lot of men who have peripheral artery disease, the first manifestation of it isn't even gonna be in the legs. They're gonna have erectile dysfunction. Really? Yes. Okay. So that's sort of the first sign. That's for the men. first sign. In fact, when you see, when you as a physician hear erectile dysfunction, the first thing you think of is, is this person having vascular disease? Wow. Did not know that. Now, the ulcers mean reduced blood flow to an area of the body, when poor body flows causes cells to die and damages tissue. And most ulcers occur on the feet and legs. So these types of wounds can be slow to heal. So let's take a look at some of these symptoms. Uh, doctor, if you can talk to us about um, this condition. Well, so you've got this graphic up with, um, with the, the, the thing with the ulcers. Um, those wounds are very important to find. This is why the American Heart Association recommends taking your shoes off, taking your socks off, and looking at your feet. Mm -hmm. Because many times, by the time the circulation is bad enough that you've developed an ulcer, poor circulation also damages the nerve. So the person has initially what would be a painless ulcer. And the person, sometimes, for example, I, I, you see this happen, the person gets a pedicure. And you develop a cut, a little thing, mm -hmm. and it develops into this chronic wound and then an ulcer. And you don't feel it you because you have it. nerve damage. And that will eventually deepen, spread to the bone, and now you're going to lose a limb. And it's often the case when you have these wounds, a the patient doesn't feel them. They don't feel them. And they only get worse. They only get worse, which is why you need to look at your feet, which is why diabetics can go to a podiatrist and have diabetic foot care. Because if you don't have diabetic right. foot care, you can get an ulcer and you can lose your leg unnecessarily. 
Now, let's go over some of the risk factors for peripheral vascular disease. So how many of them can we actually control and how many of them can't we not? That's a very interesting topic. So the one that obviously everyone can't control is age, right? I mean, right. You, can, you know, the alternative is not good. So, you know, <laughs> uh, th that you can't control. But, diet, and on the other hand, uh, um, cholesterol, diabetes, um, high blood pressure, those are controllable. Right. History of smoking is a very good that, that's put there. That I like the way the American Heart Association did this. And the reason I like it is because smoking damages the arteries. But even if you stop, there is still an increased risk of arterial disease just from having smoked in the past. Right. So smokers really need to have good care and need to look at their feet. Absolutely. Now, but in what other ways does it affect if you have PVG, like the smoking? So the smoking does uh, several things. Uh, smoking directly causes plaque formation in the, in, the, in the arteries, but it also causes a relative hypoxia. So it, it, this, this, the smoking itself reduces the oxygenation to the peripheral tissues. Okay. And smoking directly puts toxins into the bloodstream. When you smoke, you've got to think of a cigarette as a drug delivery system. A cigarette, a cigar, really. mm -hmm. uh, a pipe. Um, so inhaling a medication is a very fast, very effective way of getting a substance, any substance, mm -hmm. into your bloodstream. That's what the lungs are for. So when you smoke, all of these toxins go straight into your blood, and they go in quickly. That's why people feel this, you know, if you have a craving for a cigarette and you have the cigarette, you feel this, this kind of immediate relief when mm -hmm. you have that first puff because you immediately absorb that medicine. Right. Uh, but it immediately it can affect you as well. Of course, of course, <laughs> absolutely. Now, men, men are more likely to have PVG than women? Actually, women, men are more likely to have it, but women are much more affected when they have it. Really? Okay, so explain that. Actually, we don't know why. <gasps> oh, okay. And why but is that? Women, it's, it's unclear. It's, it's, we know that when women get peripheral artery disease, they suffer more from it whether that's because men have higher muscle mass or, or because muscle mass is important in, in helping circulation, um, or some other reason, we know that women with peripheral vascular disease tend not to do as well as men with mm -hmm. the same condition, with the same degree of condition. The women do worse. Does that mean the prognosis for women is worse can than men? Can be worse, yes. Okay. And now how do, can the prognosis be like sort of overturned or can... Well, uh, you know, again, aggressive treatment of risk factors for vascular disease is essential, right? So, you know, controlling all the diabetes and the, mm -hmm. and the, and the, the smoking and the, and, and the cholesterol and all these things, taking the medications. Right. But more importantly, exercise. Those lifestyle changes, Those right? Those lifestyle changes <laughs> are huge, especially Quit smoking, exercise. eat better, exercise. It's amazing how exercise really can help the early stages of peripheral artery disease and can really help you overcome that condition. Right. Uh, it's just that people don't like to exercise. I mean, you know, you can make an <laughs> excuse that the reason you got peripheral vascular disease is because you didn't want to exercise did in the first place. So. But if you did. But if you did, you wouldn't have had it. Right. So there we are. There we are. Now up next, we're talking about a pain that can occur in the lower part of your body and some people find it embarrassing to talk about. So stay tuned to find out what it is. You're watching the Health Channel, all health, all the time on South Florida PBS. If you have a question for the doctor, please call in using the toll-free number 855-796-4475. And visit our website, allhealthtv.com, where you can watch a live stream of the Health Channel and videos from previous episodes. We'll be right back. Thanks for teaching me about teamwork and leadership. Thanks for showing me that sports help me stay healthy and do well in school. And thank you for teaching me about concussion. Letting me know that I should tell you if I think I have a concussion. And how to protect my head and brain. Because one day, I want to be a teacher. An astronaut, scientist, or a coach. Just like you. Thank you for protecting my future.
Each year, an estimated 12,000 women are diagnosed with cervical cancer. Thanks to improved screening and vaccination, cervical cancer is a highly preventable and treatable cancer. Early detection is key. Women should pay close attention to their cervical health by following these guidelines. Start testing at age 21. Women between ages 21 and 29 should have a pap test done every three years. Women between the ages of 30 and 65 should have a pap test plus an HPV test done every five years. A woman who has been vaccinated against HPV should still follow the screening recommendations for her age group. Your particular health history may dictate a different screening schedule for cervical cancer. Contact your primary care physician to talk about your history and schedule your next screening today. Families come in all sizes and shapes. Sometimes your friends are your family by choice, or sometimes you're just stuck with Uncle Charles. But what we know is that you want to protect the people that are close to you. But the flu can unravel everything. Your flu vaccine protects you and your family. No matter what draws your family together, protect yourself. Protect your family. Everyone needs a flu vaccine. like all the other dogs, but I was born for a purpose, to one day be your companion, your eyes to see the world. I'll be your courage, your friend. With me, you'll find new freedom and hope for a better future. A dog I'm not. I'm a Southeastern guide dog. Welcome back to the Health Channel, all health, all the time. I'm Kathy Buccio. And we're talking about managing pain with Dr. Antonio Mesa, a neurologist with Baptist Hospital and the president-elect of the Day County Medical Association. But first, now is your opportunity to call in with your questions. Use our toll-free number, 855-796-4475. Now, Dr. Mesa is here to answer all your questions. In our last segment, we talked about peripheral vascular disease and the pain it causes. So let's switch gears and talk about pelvic pain which usually refers to pain in the regions of a woman's reproductive organs, but you're standing next to a 3D image of the male anatomy, Dr. Mesa, so explain what it is that we're looking at. Okay, so um, right now this is the, the male pelvis. Men and women can have pelvic pain. It's very important to recognize mm -hmm. that. Um, and then there's a variety of structures, so there's a variety of reasons that you would have pain in the pelvic region. Uh, what we're looking at right now is we're looking at um, prostate, we're looking at the colon, uh, this you can't really see it very well, but these are the testicles, this is the penis, but there's more. There's the ligaments and the bones of the pelvis itself, there's the musculature which can cause pain, and it can cause pain from a condition, for example, where in the neck, which is the most common place it happens, um, you have a, a thing called cervical dystonia, which is an abnormal muscle tone in the neck. You can get that in the pelvis, and it's very, very uncomfortable. So is it a symptom of an infection, possibly? Nope. No. No. Oh. Now, there are some pelvic pain conditions that are a cause, a direct cause of an infection. So for example, uh, in men, you can get chronic prostatitis from a, an infection uh, that happened and may have, and, and usually has resolved. In women, you can get pelvic inflammatory disease. Again, it's an infection, uh, sometimes it's chronic, sometimes it's resolved, but, but the patient is left with this chronic inflammatory pain in the pelvic region. Right. Uh, and and it's, it's very, very painful for the patient. Uh, and it requires treatment, and, it, and it, it's, it's, a, it's something that happens after an infection, but is not necessarily caused by the infection. Right. Sometimes it is. Now, Dr. Mesa, what other things can cause pelvic pain? What could be the source? Uh, any, any structure here, can cause pain, right? So one of the big ones that we worry about uh, as interventional pain specialists is, for example, if someone has uh, pain in the bones of the pelvis, you immediately start thinking cancer because mm. this is a common area for bony metastasis. So pelvic bone can sometimes indicate 
cancer. Uh, cancer. Yeah. Okay. Now you can also get, and you can you can see one joint here. This is the pubic symphysis. You can get pain from inflammation of the joints of the pelvis. Uh, very commonly, we see this uh, all the time uh, at, in the sacroiliac joint, which is the joint between this bone, which is the iliac bone, mm -hmm. and the base of the spine, which is right behind here, which is, you can see it here, uh, which is the sacrum. So there's a joint there. It's very, very common right. to get that uh, inflamed and painful. Coccidinia, which is the coccyx, your tailbone, right here. Right. Uh, you can't really see it from here, but it's, it's right back here. And this gives you pain right in the coccyx, and, and it's awful when you sit. It's very painful. Sometimes you can get even pain in the rectum from that. Um, so those are musculoskeletal causes of pain. You can get also uh, a tendonitis from the tendons of the muscles that insert into the pelvic bone. Right. All of these are orthopedic causes of pelvic pain. Now, it's, are the risk factors different for men? For the pain, or? It depends on what the source of the pain is. So, for example, on some of these, like uh, like the tendonitis and, and, and the coccidinia, no, they're the same. On the other hand, for some other conditions, uh, it, it's, it's a little different, right? So one of the causes of pelvic pain, a, a, a relatively common cause, is interstitial cystitis. That's, of course, more common in women than in men. Um, and then there are, there are some conditions, just because women's anatomy is different and because women Remember, the hormonal changes, the physical changes throughout a woman's life are more, um, are, are larger in amplitude than you would get in a man. And before we keep going, because I want you to expand on that, I want to change the image here to the female pelvis anatomy. Okay. And I, let's keep talking about what you were talking about, why in a woman's lifespan, the, obviously the differences are much bigger than men. Well, I mean, let's think about it, right? I mean, this is, this is the uterus. That uterus, in many women, will have a baby. You know, this organ, which is really, I don't know what, the size of my fist, is going to get huge. And that's going to push all of this out of the way. And it's going to push the sacrum back, and it's going to put pressure on all these organs. Men don't have that. Um, and then when, after, the, after childbirth, all of the, 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 these, these changes that happen during pregnancy go back. Well, that, that, those are big changes that men just don't have. Dr. Mesa, are you saying women are the superior sex? Is that what I'm hearing from you over sure. there? <laughs> okay, so, uh, so this kind of goes back into the whole thing that you were saying that can be embarrassing for someone to bring up, especially for women. Is this it true? Is. It is. And in fact, uh, and, and we were just discussing this, women sometimes are embarrassed to even mention problems to other women, to their friends, to their relatives, because they're embarrassing. Now, mind you, men are also embarrassed. I mean, a lot of guys, they, they, they just feel hesitant about mentioning pelvic pain. But in women, too. Usually what happens is by the time someone has so much pain that they can't take it anymore and they mention it, the condition is pretty advanced. And as we were discussing, when, it's, when the cause is nerve pain, that causes permanent changes in the nerves uh, in the spinal cord. Really. Right. So what, are women more at risk for pelvic pain based on, on the graphic that we're seeing here? To me, yes. I think women tend to be more at risk uh, in the sense that all of these changes kind of, any time you have uh, not stasis, not continuity, you can have a problem. And because there are changes in, in the pelvic region of a woman throughout her life, this makes them more prone to right. have problems. Now, doctor, we want you to come okay. back to the desk because we're going to talk about another condition you briefly mentioned before, which is called interstitial cystitis, also known as bladder pain syndrome. So what kind of condition is, is this, and can you explain that to, to the viewers at home? So this is a, this is a very uncomfortable uh, condition, uh, and, and nobody really knows why it happens. Mm -hmm. it's, a very, it, it's a very confusing entity for us. But... Um, what happens is the person feels almost like they have a chronic urinary tract infection, right? Mm. You have this sense of urgency that you've got to go to the bathroom, but when you go, there's really nothing there. Right. Um, it's very painful to urinate. Intercourse is painful. Um, there, there isn't any evidence of infection. There's not that you know, heavy bleeding, although when you look, inside the bladder, frequently they find these kind of ulcerations on the bladder wall. Mm -hmm. 
But ultimately, we think this is a neurological condition. Now, there's questions about whether it might be um, somehow autoimmune. Uh, the, 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 you know, this condition sometimes responds to antihistamines, you know, Claritin, um, Zyrtec, those kinds of things. Right. But, you know, the, a lot of women who have this have irritable bowel syndrome, which for us as neurologists is a type of migraine. Um, and remember, migraine in children presents typically as abdominal pain. So it's abdominal migraine is not an unusual condition. Wow. And there's a lot of patients who get it diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome and they actually have migraine. But then how do you even begin to diagnose someone that, and, that, and know that they have this syndrome? So what we do is we, we the, the symptoms really are the key there. Okay. Followed by the cystoscopy, right? Where the, where the urologist goes in there and looks and sees the lesions. Uh, the urologists treat this very frequently as do the gynecologists. Um, and they see it all the time because you have these people who have this chronic urinary tract symptom, urinary tract infection symptom, and you do the urine test, there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. But the symptoms don't go away, so you start looking. And when you see that they have these, these again, chronic urinary tract right. uh, infection symptoms, and you see the changes in the bladder, you make the diagnosis. Sometimes, I'm sorry, no, sometimes no, no, they do a test, um, not always. Um, is a potassium uh, chloride test where they, they, they put a substance that isn't normally bothersome to a person with a normal bladder, but is extremely painful to someone with interstitial cystitis. But now being that it is more of a neurolog neurological disorder, is it treatable in the sense, is this person gonna live with a bladder syndrome for the rest of their lives? Well, so, most neurological conditions are not curable. Right. Uh, we can control them, uh, but, you know, we can control migraine, uh, we can control, um, you know, epilepsy, we can control all of these conditions, mm -hmm. but the fact remains that they're chronic conditions. Right. And so there's treatment, and the idea is to get the person treated. And remember what I said earlier about the spinal cord um, the nerves in the spinal cord making connections that they shouldn't be right. making. Mm -hmm. Our goal is to make those connections kind of shrink back, right. go away. And that may require ongoing treatment, but hopefully the person's pain is controlled so that the ongoing treatment is successful. And okay, you have to maybe take a medicine or get a treatment, but, but you don't but have to. But at least it's under control. Correct. Okay. Now, we've been talking a lot about symptoms and complications of pelvic pain, but coming up, Dr. Mesa will have the treatment plan to feel better. So stay tuned if you're watching the Health Channel, All Health, all the time on South Florida PBS. If you have a question for Dr. Mesa, please call in using the toll-free number 855-796-4475. And visit our website, allhealthtv.com, where you can watch a live stream of the Health Channel and watch videos from previous shows. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to the Health Channel. All health, all the time. I'm Kathy Buccio, and we're talking about managing pain with Dr. Antonio Mesa, a neurologist with Baptist Hospital and the president-elect of the Day County Medical Association. But first, now is your opportunity to call in with your questions. Use our number, 855-796-4475. Dr. Mesa is here to answer all your questions. Now we've been talking about pelvic pain and the causes and symptoms, but let's now focus on treatment. Now doctor, get your prescription pad out and write a treatment plan for us. What would that look like? Well, so the first thing we, we again, that I mentioned earlier, we, mm -hmm. we're gonna figure out where this pain is coming from. Exactly. Um, in the case of peripheral vascular disease, we have to treat the risk factors, right, uh, for peripheral vascular disease, right? Make sure the diabetes and all this other stuff is controlled, patients trying to do some exercise. But for peripheral vascular disease, uh, in addition to the lifestyle changes and the control of risk factors, sometimes uh, patients get um, stents placed, like you would in the heart, right. Right, the little mesh. We do it here, here at the hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do bypass. And then there are a group of people that have small vessel disease. So the vessel that is affected by the, by the arterial disease is so small you can't put a catheter in there. For those people, we can put a spinal cord stimulator in, and that actually opens up the circulation, and it can be limb saving. It can save a limb. Wow, but so do you usually start with medication first, or? We start with lifestyle changes. So right. usually. Uh, lifestyle first, and then correct. that's always. Correct, because I can't, it, think of all medical treatment right. as a pyramid. Right, so if the base isn't there, everything you add on top of it is not gonna work. So if the person is unwilling to do a lifestyle change, if the person continues, for example, to smoke. Or exercise, like you mentioned or, earlier. Or not exercise, how, how can I help that? Right. None, none of us can. Um, so on, on the pelvic pain side, of course, uh, the first thing we do is we make sure that the patient has a gynecologist or urologist that has done a complete workup and other causes mm -hmm. of pelvic pain are, are addressed, right? I mean, if the person has a structural lesion that needs surgery or something, I mean, that's, that's gotta be done. Otherwise, you'll never fix anything. Right. Uh, but if it's a neurological condition, then we start using uh, medications, therapy. We have an excellent pelvic floor uh, rehab program here. Yes, you do, We've, they've been on the show. They're really good. <laughs> yes. I, I send them patients all the time. They're, they're very, very good, very well trained. We're, actually, I gotta tell you, in, in, in Miami, um, we are very lucky because we have the full spectrum of all medical specialties needed to treat the full range of medical conditions. I mean, this is not, this is not some small town in the sticks. You know, if, if, if you have a medical condition, you will be able to get it treated in Miami. And in fact, we get people coming from all over to get treatment here. Absolutely. Now, one of the things I wanted to ask you is if you are on medication um, for any disorder, does that aggravate the condition? Sometimes it can. Okay. Sometimes it can, and and uh, and then we work with the with the physician prescribing the medication to try to to maybe change the medication or or or, or somehow change the dose. And sometimes it's not possible. Right. And then you have to come up with an alternative. But ultimately, the goal is is to get a treatment that doesn't cause other that the side effects don't cause a problem. Right. Now, in terms of physical therapists, are there benefits to working with one? Absolutely, I, th I think, uh, you know, for both peripheral vascular disease and pelvic uh, pain, uh, I think a good physical therapist it's is key. going to, yeah, you're, you're, I don't think you're gonna get optimal results. And this is something that I wanted to mention about pain control. Our goal is not pain control. Our goal is to optimize function while minimizing pain control. I can make you have no pain at all if I put you in a coma, but I haven't done you a favor. <laughs> right. Right? So we, I, we need to get... That's the reality, though. I think that's a discussion that a doctor and a patient should have Correct. initially. It's Correct. To go in there and say, hey, your pain may not go away, but it's not the goal. Right. The goal is to get you to function so you can lead a normal life. Right. Now, do you ever recommend a TENS machine? We do. Uh, we use them a lot, and uh, that's part of the neurostimulation. So TENS unit are transcutaneous electrical neurostimulators. Those are through the skin. Mm -hmm. um, we also do transcranial direct stimulation. We do uh, deep brain stimulation. We How do, do those help? Well, those, uh, that's, <laughs> it's a very effective. We have a very good movement disorder program at Baptist. Very okay. good. Uh, for patients who have essential tremor, who have Parkinson's disease, 
Uh, one of my partners is, is, is the head of that, and he's very, very good at that. However, some people are using it for chronic pain. And they're very okay. effective. Uh, but they are, it's, it's, a, it's surgery. I mean, you're getting two holes in your head. Um, somebody like me who doesn't have much hair, uh, you're <laughs> going to see little bumps where the, where the leads go in. Right. Uh, so usually that's not, we don't do deep brain stimulation for pain here at Baptist. You have to go to an academic center. Um, but spinal cord stimulation is done routinely. Right. And it's very effective for a lot of neuropathic, which is to say um, um, pain from nervous system origin, not from mm -hmm. something else. For example, you know, you know, they cut your leg off. It hurts not because the nerve is cut, but because they cut your leg they off. They cut your leg off. Um, but when the nervous system isn't working properly, stimulating the nerves electrically can be very effective in controlling the pain. Now we talked about the lifestyle change, we talked about possibly medication depending on what disorder you're talking about, maybe using a TENS machine. Surgery, is that ever an option? Surgery is, is, is an option depending on the condition. So okay. for example, in peripheral artery disease, uh, somebody has a, um, a, a, a stenosis, right? You're gonna need to do, if it's a large vessel, you need to do a, 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 a uh, you need to stent it. You need to put a catheter through there and put a stent in there, put a wire mesh in there to open up the artery. Sometimes you even need to do a bypass. I mean, th th those are essential treatments for, the, for controlling peripheral artery disease. Uh, some other conditions, though, surgery is not gonna help. Uh, pelvic inflammatory disease, not gonna help. Not gonna help. Interstitial cystitis, not gonna help. Chronic prostatitis, not gonna help. Uh, so one of the questions that patients always ask is, well, why can't you just cut it out? Right. right. I mean, this hurts. Just cut it out. Turns out that the cut it out approach has been tried many times in the past. Doesn't always never work. work. Right. Actually, it never works. Uh, and the patient is left with more pain. Right. Rather than less pain. Now, if you're talking about pelvic pain and the cause can be identified, what happens? How do you treat from there? So, if if we identify the cause, our goal is to calm. Let's let's take it from my perspective, which mm -hmm. is uh, nerve pain. So. Our goal is to calm the nerve down so you no longer have an irritated nerve causing you pain. Right. So an irritated nerve in the brain causes a seizure. An irritated nerve outside of the brain causes pain, which is why we use the medications that we use, which are typically anti-epileptics. Mm -hmm. so people always ask, why if I have pain and I don't have a seizure, are you giving me an anti-epileptic? Right. Well, I'm treating the irritated nerve. Um, we use certain antidepressants, not all antidepressants help for pain, only certain antidepressants help for pain, and only at certain doses, it's very interesting. But why antidepressants? Like, what is it in antidepressants that helps with pain? Nah, that's a very good physical question. Physical pain, yeah. Yeah, it's physical pain. So, uh, there are two uh, categories of antidepressants that are very effective for pain. They're the tricyclic antidepressants, that's the amitriptyline, the nortriptyline, and so forth, and the serotonin, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, which are uh, Cymbalta, uh, uh, Savella, Effexor, and it's because they work on norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is a neurotransmitter okay. that is used by the body to transmit pain signals. On the other hand, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, Paxil, Prozac, Lexapro, Selexa, they don't really do much for pain because they don't do anything for, ser for, for norepinephrine. They have nothing to do with the neurotransmitters you were discussing with the other antidepressant medications. Correct, because it doesn't affect the norepinephrine system. In fact, mm -hmm. at higher doses of the tricyclic antidepressants and the serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, you don't get any more bang for your buck. So in other words, let's say you're treating somebody with nerve pain and you're using amitriptyline. And you start at a very low dose, and they're better, but you need more. And so you keep increasing it. Beyond a certain point, you're not going to get any more norepinephrine effect. Right. You're only going to get serotonin effect, and that's not going to help your pain. That's not going to help the pain. No. Now, how about injections? So injections are commonly used for nerve pain. Okay. Uh, they're but it's temporary. Nerve, not necessarily. Okay. If, if the nerve is irritated and I can put a needle along the nerve and put a little local anesthetic and a, a, uh, a steroid like, uh, like Kenalog or, or dexamethasone, I can calm the inflammation of that nerve down, and now I've taken away the inflammation, the pain gets better. Right. And it, it may not necessarily come back, particularly if I do it 
and I have the patient on a medication. So now I've directly taken away the inflammation and I've indirectly taken away the inflammation. Now the pain is gone. But is that a series of injections or how does that treatment work? Depends on the condition, but it can be a series, it can be one, it can be two. There's no dogma here. I mean, you can, you, you know, the, 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 you know, the, back in the day, everybody used to get three epidurals, for example, for right. back pain. Uh, there's no need to go with three epidurals. You, right. you, you can go with one or you can go with two. One typically doesn't work, but two works very well. For um, pelvic pain, for example, I have a patient we were just discussing. Uh, he's, he's got uh, some pelvic pain and I'm gonna do a pudendal nerve block. A lot of these guys, one, maybe two, it's enough. And that's it? That's it, they're fine. Now, we've talked about a lot of ways to deal with pain, but we left out one. Coming up, we'll talk about prescription with serious side effects and risks. You're watching the Health Channel, all health, all the time, on South Florida PBS. If you have a question for the doctor, please call in using the toll-free number, 855-796-4475. And visit our website, allhealthtv.com, where you can watch a live stream of the Health Channel and watch videos from previous shows. We'll be right back. Migraines are pulsating headaches that often occur on one side of the head. If you suffer from migraines, you're familiar with the throbbing, one-sided pain that makes you sensitive to light and noise and causes nausea or vomiting. Some home remedies for migraine pain include changing your diet, monitoring triggers, scalp massages, using an ice pack, anti-inflammatory herbs like peppermint or chamomile, and staying hydrated. Contact your primary care physician about treatment options available to you today. Emily is thinking about taking a dietary supplement. She knows she should try to get her vitamins and minerals from the food she eats, but she doesn't always have the chance to eat right. And with more than 50,000 dietary supplements on the market, like a lot of other people, Emily has questions. Like how much vitamin A is good for you and how much is too much? If something's natural, doesn't it mean it's safe? Can folic acid prevent birth defects? Should we be taking calcium and vitamin D supplements? Luckily, there's a place everyone can go for answers. It's the website of the Office of Dietary Supplements. We're part of the National Institutes of Health, and since 1995, we've been conducting, funding, and evaluating research that we use to educate the public, giving Emily plenty of information she can share and discuss with her health care providers. We're ODS for what you need to know about dietary supplements. C stands for cutting edge research clinical trials and collaboration. Creating breakthrough treatments as Florida's only member of the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Alliance. At Miami Cancer Institute, C also stands for CURE. World-class cancer care right here at home. Learn more at MiamiCancerInstitute.com. Fifty years, we've made a lot of progress in smoking prevention. But if we don't do more, one out of every 13 children alive today will die early from smoking. That's 5.6 million precious lives we can save. Together, we can make the next generation tobacco free. Welcome back to the Health Channel, all health, all the time. I'm Kathy Buccio, and with me is Dr. Antonio Mesa, a neurologist with Baptist Hospital and the president-elect of the Day County Medical Association. But first now is your opportunity to call in with your questions. Use your toll-free number, 855-796-4475. Now in this segment, we're gonna focus on the opioid epidemic. More than 130 people died every day from the opiate-related drug overdose in 2016 and in 2017, according to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. 
Now, some people might think taking prescription opioids are safer than alcohol or illegal drugs, but the truth is they carry serious risks and side effects. So let's find out more from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Prescription opioids are a type of drug used to manage pain. They include Oxycontin, Vicodin, and morphine, among others. Some people might think prescription opioids are safer than alcohol or illegal drugs, but the truth is they carry serious risks and side effects. In fact, anyone can become addicted to prescription opioids, even when prescribed by a doctor. Abusing or misusing opioids can result in loss of control. It can affect your ability to keep a job and maintain healthy relationships. It can even lead to overdose and death. Prescription opioids can have a number of side effects, even when taken as directed. Some of those include physical dependence, increased sensitivity to pain, constipation, nausea, confusion, and depression. You can make informed decisions about your pain management. Talk to your doctor about non-opioid options like ibuprofen or acetaminophen, antidepressants, exercise, and other therapies. If your doctor prescribes opioids, ask how long you'll need to take the medicine and how you'll know when it's time to stop. Take only the amount prescribed. Talk to your doctor about all of your medications. It's very dangerous to combine opioids with certain other drugs. Talk to your doctor about all of your concerns. Follow-up is important. I feel like in the last few years, we've really been talking about this opioid ep epidemic. And so uh, talk to us about why it's become such an issue. Uh, well. <laughs> like where to begin. Yeah, right? well, so, you know, what happens is we go through cycles of this. Um, right now we're going through a cycle of, of worrying about the opioids, um, but addiction to opioids has been with us um, for thousands of years. Uh, we, you know, originally there's opium in China, there's, there's a long history of abuse there, it spread all over the world, and um, this latest uh, episode really comes from the ramp up in the use of prescription uh, extended release opioids that happened during the decade of the brain back in the 90s. Back then, um, the, 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 the 90s, there was a big effort to come up with a bunch of medications to treat nervous system problems. Right. And of course, a very effective medication for pain turns out to be opioids. What people don't realize is that opioids are most effective for acute pain. You'll notice that I didn't mention the use of opioids for either peripheral vascular disease or pelvic pain. And the reason I didn't is because these are chronic conditions and you don't want to use opioids for chronic conditions unless you absolutely have to because opioids just don't work very well for chronic conditions. And they become very addicting for chronic conditions. They are very addicting, but there's a lot of addiction uh, that isn't just opioids. Right. We have problems here in Dade County with uh, benzodiazepines, right? So Xanax is a, is, is a very favored drug here. There's also a lot of abuse of central nervous system stimulants, Ritalin, Adderall. Uh, this is rampant, uh, particularly uh, on college campuses. Wow. Uh, but we don't discuss it. We discuss opioids. And I think part of the reason we discuss opioids is because it is, it is quite a big problem and it is affecting, it's, it's devastating parts of the country. Uh, fortunately, here in Dade County, it's not as bad as other places, even in Florida. There, there are other counties in Florida that are really badly affected. Here, we're a little bit better off. In terms of opioids, we're, you know, we're a little bit worse off in terms of other drugs, but right. opioids, we're, we're a little bit better off. Now, what is the, how is the association helping the cause? What is the goal of the medical association? So our, like we, we'd like to, to have, we'd like to promote responsible opioid prescribing. I'm on the mayor's opioid task force. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of things that are being done to, to not only prevent, but also uh, prevent opioid abuse, but also to treat people who are addicted. Um, we, we have a lot of, of treatment programs available. Uh, I would say, however, and this is very important for anyone who either has an opioid addiction or has a relative or friend that has an opioid addiction, to be very, very careful where they seek treatment. Right. So here at Baptist, we have an addiction treatment program that's very good. There are many addiction treatment programs. Some of them are excellent. 
there are others that are less good, and we have heard stories that do not make the press about horrific things that happen in these centers. So it is important to choose a good place to get your addiction treatment. And I cannot emphasize that enough. Again, there are many good places in Dade County, many good places in the state. Right. Look before you leave. With that said, and your emphasis on horrific, I'd like to know what some of those are, but how do you even begin to find, if you have an addiction or think someone has an addiction, what are the things that you look for to find a place that is going to be to help you? Well, the big problem for most people is getting it covered. Right. So insurance coverage is, is a limiting factor for all of us, really, because we, you know, we all have health insurance that we all pay for, and, and we'd like to use what we're paying for, so let's start there. Right. But um, unfortunately for addicts in particular, there's, a, there's this kind of a social drift where as you get deeper and deeper into your addiction, you are less and less able to function in society, and so you're less and less able to hold down a job, you're less and less able to... It's a domino effect, then you don't have your insurance, and if you don't have your insurance, then you can seek treatment. Right, and, and, and there are still very many good options for people who don't have health insurance. Um, uh, we pay quite a bit of money in taxes here in Dade County, and it covers treatment. It's just you, you, you need to find a good place, and, and, and there are resources online mm -hmm. through Miami-Dade County where they can hook you up with places to go that you can get treatment. For those uh, viewers at home, for some women who not understand opioids, uh, addiction, how does it affect the brain? Why is it sometimes a little more challenging to quit an opioid addiction? Uh, well, you know, opioid addiction, there, there are some substances that create a physical dependence. Right. And those are the hardest to come off of. So opioids are one of them, right? But there are others, cigarettes, alcohol, benzodiazepines, they're all um, addictions that create a physical dependence. And so with a physical dependence, patients get a withdrawal syndrome. And, and um, there's this, there's, some withdrawal syndromes are deadly. The opioid withdrawal syndrome is not deadly, although it is uncomfortable. Um, and it, uh, it makes it harder to begin right. to come off of opioids. All of the addictions have a psychological component. And, and you see that, for example, in, in cigarette smoking, where cigarette smokers kind of almost define themselves as smokers. I, I am a smoker, not I smoke, but I am a smoker. Uh, that's a psychological thing. That has nothing to do with nicotine. So that controlling the psychological part, getting out of the environment where there are people using opioids, getting out of the environment where, where opioid use is not, is, is easy to, mm -hmm. to do, uh, that is, is, is just as hard as getting through the physical withdrawal, which right. only lasts about a week. Wow. Now, I feel like we have so much more to talk about, so that means you need to come on to another show, <laughs> Dr. Mesa, because we have run out of time. But be sure to join us next time on The Health Channel, All Health, All the Time, on South Florida PBS. Follow us on social media at All Health TV, where you can get a health tips from our experts and see what's coming up on The Health Channel. Be sure to visit our website, allhealthtv.com, where you can watch a live stream of The Health Channel and watch videos from previous episodes. I'm Kathy Buccio. We'll see you next time.